Okay, so we're looking at the graph of the tangent on the interval from zero to two pi. So we're seeing two periods of the tangents. We want to find the one-sided limits at pi over two, and we can uh, do that graphically. But I'm going to write this in my notebook. All right, so we have f of x equals the tangent of x. And quick sketch. Let's see, we have asymptotes at pi over two and three pi over two. So usually I like to draw the asymptotes in as dotted lines. So they're like boundaries for this function. And then the function swoops through pi there and comes up ooh, the other side and similar here. And we're only looking, oh, it's supposed to be an arrow. And then over here we terminate because we stop at uh, two pi. So here's my function and I wanna know what is the limit as x approaches pi over two on the left side of the tangent of x. Let me make sure I got that right. Limit x approaches pi over two on the left of this function, and then three pi over two on the right. All right. So uh, as x approaches pi over 2, we can see graphically uh, we are on the left side. So where's my highlighter? So we're on this left side right here. And as x gets closer to pi over 2 there, the y values are increasing. We're moving along the curve in this direction right there. And so by looking at the graph, and we could explore this numerically too if we wanted, uh, we should see that this is approaching infinity. And remember, infinity is a fancy way of saying it doesn't exist with little extra information. So infinity really means the limit does not exist, but we can see that is increasing forever. Oops. And often we say increasing without a boundary, increasing without bound. Nothing stopping it. So the closer x gets to pi over 2 on the left side, the y values just keep getting larger and larger and larger up that way. <clears throat> and anytime we have uh, an x value, uh, an x is approaching a fixed uh, real number and y increases forever or decreases forever, um, this is what's known, this is the basic definition right here of a vertical asymptote. which you have familiarity with from your pre-calculus days. And then we also wanted to take a look at the limit as x approached, I think it was three pi over two, but on the right side, tangent of x, double check I read that right. Yep, on the right side. And so what do we see there? So we are on the right side of three pi over two. So X is approaching uh, from the right there and the Y values seem to be dropping as we head down that way right there. And again, we could explore numerically, but I think the graph is sufficient here. And so on this side, it looks like we have a negative infinity which negative infinity is shorthand for saying does not exist, but in this case, it's decreasing without bound. And I'm gonna move that chat out of the way. Let me make some notes about what you guys wrote first. 43, 23, 26, one. 
Zoom in a little bit. Nope, that's it. All right, and then back to the question. All right, so pi over two on the left side, three pi over two on the right side, and they each want to know what, what does that indicate about a vertical asymptote. So here, x equals pi over two, and here there's a vertical asymptote at x equals three pi over two. And what's that? So let me see, I should put, um, should accept infinity and negative infinity. Boom. Cool. Questions on that one? All right, so moving on, I'm going to jump to Evan's question on number 43. All right, what do we got here? Let's blow it up. So we've got this piecewise function right here, and we want to uh, select all the points at which uh, the graph is not differentiable. So uh, not differentiable means the derivative doesn't exist uh, at a particular point. And it's related to continuity. And there's some good examples of the book on this. So if, if you think about the, remember we looked at the absolute value function the other day, uh, it behaved really nice, uh, except at that point where of the V and at that point of the V, we had a problem because on one side, the slope was negative one. On the other side, the slope was positive one. So at X equals zero, we had a conflict that we couldn't resolve. And that would be a place where the derivative doesn't exist. So if you look here at that point, negative one, three, we have a slope of one, right? That's a nice straight line on the left side. So we have a slope of one heading toward X equals negative one. But on the other side, the slope is doing other stuff. And if we zoom in more there, let's see, can I get that graph in a new window? Nope, just gotta zoom in this way, whoa. Um, it's possible that slope is even getting vertical there, that we have a, a, a vertical tangent line on the right side. So the left side slope doesn't agree with the right side slope, so we don't have a derivative there. So not differentiable at x equals negative one. If you pick any other point, like over here, like if we pick the point negative two, two, uh, the slope is one coming in from the left, the slope is one coming in from the right. That's nice, the slope is one at that point. Uh, if you pick a curvy part here, um, you know, I'm gonna estimate that at the point zero, two, that the slope is negative one half, say, and as I approach from the right side, it's, it's, a, it's getting the secant, the, the secant's getting closer or the tangents are getting closer and on the left side it's getting closer um, and we could play with i could reproduce something like this in desmos or geogebra if you wish to play with uh, so so any point along the curve in between negative one and all the way up to the edge of x equals three things behave nice but then all of a sudden we have this jump here uh, we have uh, a discontinuous function. If a function is discontinuous, that means the limit doesn't exist there. If the limit doesn't exist, the derivative can't exist because the derivative is a limit, right? We do a limit to get a derivative. So anywhere the function is discontinuous, it's certainly different, not differentiable. So that's at x equals three. It's not differentiable. Um, and then since there's no ending point here, I'm assuming that this probably kept going down parabolic like maybe, and this one linearly kept going down. Uh, so the only points that are trouble I see are this cusp point here at negative one, three, that's a problem. And then this broken part is a problem. So those are all the points I see, all the X values I see where the graph would not be differentiable. Does that help? Further questions on that? All right, I don't 
don't hear any voice and I see nothing in the chat. Oh shit, is my sound even on? I forgot to test that. You guys can hear me apparently. I think my speakers are on. All right, so I'm gonna take silence as no questions. Next, um, let's go back to question number one. All right, question number one. Suppose an arrow is shot upward on the moon with a velocity of 35 meters per second. Its height in meters after t seconds is given by h of t equals 35t minus uh, 0.38t squared. Find the average velocity over time. So average velocity is just slope. So just I'm just going to do one part of this. I'm not going to do the whole thing. We're just going to find the slope uh, given those two x values. So 35t minus 0.83t squared. And graphing this in something like Desmos or GeoGebra is always a good idea. I'm going to do the second to last part. I'm going to find the slope between x equals 4 or t equals 4 and t equals 4.01. All right, so again, we're finding the average velocity over the given time intervals. And so each of these is a different time interval. And a spreadsheet would be a cool way to do this too, because then we could see them all together at once. And yeah, that sounds like fun. I'm gonna do a spreadsheet. All right, so, cause the spreadsheet can do quick math. So let's go to Google Drive and make a new spreadsheet. Come on, Google, catch up. Okay, so I'm just going to make a note, my function h of t, it didn't need to be capital, but that's okay, is 35 times t minus 0 0.83 times t raised to the second power. And then um, I guess I just need some values of t here, and they all start at 4, and then they jump from there. So like there was the value of five and then I don't know, was it like 4.5 maybe and 4.01 and I was gonna do 4.01. Uh, and so I wanna find the slope always starting at four but going to some other number. 4.001, ah, let's see that again. Oh, it's on the same screen. I was gonna do 4.01, all right. go. Um, and so slope is just, uh, you know, rise over run. So on a calculator, I'm just going to type in my expression, parentheses for the numerator, I got 35 times this value of t minus 0 0.83 times this value of t raised to the second power. And actually, let's do it an easier way. Let's calculate the heights for each of these. That'll make it easier. Uh, and then we'll have another column for slope. To a given point. So equals that times 35 minus 0 0.83 times that squared. So that's the y value. Thank you, Google. Yes, let's calculate all of those. And then the slope here, for example, is just going to be this height minus the height at four divided by this time. Oops, in parentheses there for the denominator minus that time, or that time minus the time at four. And so that's the slope there. And so we just want to find each of these slopes starting always at this point right here. And you could do it graphically too. Let me label this. This is calc rate change. Always a good data to label spreadsheets. Uh, I like GeoGebra lately. Uh, in GeoGebra and Desmos, you should use X 
T means something else in these programs, at least GeoGebra, can't remember Desmos. So H of X would equal 35 X minus 0 0.83 X squared. <clears throat> um, Desmos could make a table too, but it's a little harder to do it. I just did in uh, Desmos in the table view. Um, but here I just want to generate some points, right? So one of the points would be the point four comma H of four, and you can totally do that in um, Desmos two. And then maybe the other point I plotted was 4.001, I think was the last one I did, comma H of 4.001, did I get the X values to match? Looks like it. Um, and if I wanted, I could adjust the viewing screen to see that. So I'm moving it up to 126. And so I could either zoom or rescale. There we go. So there's one of the points. Oh, they're both like right next to each other. So let's do this a little bit different. Go to the config button and zoom in around that point. So for X, I really only care to see from like, oh, I'm super close there, um, four to 4.002, should put those two points right near each other. Right, so I'm just looking for what's the slope between those two points there. Button. And so I could calculate the slope here, uh, make a fraction by dividing what is H of 4.001 minus H of 4. And here I can clearly see the difference is 0 0.001. And is that the same number? Oh, no, I must type that. There we go. And that should be the same number I had in the spreadsheet. So any calculator tool you want, calculate away. All right, let's double check the chat. This looks like something else came in. Okay. Uh, okay, thank you. And then 44, let me write that down too. So we did 43, there's 44. We just did number one. Let's look at number 23 next. Thank you guys for responding in the chat. I really appreciate it. Um, I guess still this page and we're looking for 23. All right. Um, yeah, so we did a problem like this last week sometime where we have these two pieces, these two linear pieces, and we want to pick the right Y intercept so that they meet at X equals two. So in order for that to happen, you need to figure out, well, what is the first one thinks happening at X equals two? Um, so let me write that down. Eight X minus one, X is less than or equal to two, negative four X plus B, X is greater than two. So we gotta figure out what Y intercept makes these two things meet at X equals two. So we've got the piecewise function f of x equals, and the first definition is we use the equation uh, expression 8x minus 1 if x is less than or equal to 2, and then we use negative 4x plus b if x is greater than 2. And just I'm going to make a rough, rough sketch of what's happening here. All right, so here, let's see, one, let's put two right there. So I'm just gonna draw, it's not an asymptote, but I'm just kind of drawing the line x equals two. And these two functions have to meet on that line. And eight x minus one, what do I know about it? Uh, I know that has a y-intercept of negative one. And if you plug in two there, we get 16 minus one, which is 15. So let's say, this is one way down here, minus one way down here. And let's say that right there is 15. 
minus one. It's roughly close enough. So I'm going to graph this one in blue. So we got a point there and we have a point here and it is or equal to. So I get to shade that point right there. Um, and so this would be my line there. So that's that side. The other function has to start at that point. I'm going to graph that one in red. So it would have to start there and have a slope of negative four. So if this is a slope of eight, a slope of negative four might look something like this right here. So that's what that graph has to do. And we need to figure out if we trace back, what is its y-intercept? What is its value of b? Okay. So what do we know? We know that, let's switch back to blue, that if this two value is critical, so if we plug in two, then this one says the answer is 15. So in this one right here, the red one, if we plug in two into that, we need to know what B is so we meet at the same place at Y equals 15. So negative two, or negative four times two is what? Negative eight, add eight to the other side. And so we're gonna get B is equal to uh, 23. So at X, at Y equals 23 should be that part. Now that's not technically part of the graph because we only graph this one for X equals greater than two, but uh, it would look like, so this graph, once we calculated that B equals 23 would look like this here. Okay, so that makes it continuous. Any other Y intercept we pick for the second part of this definition would lead to a break in the function. All right, um, did I answer that adequately? If not, please put something in the chat. That was number 23. So nothing in the chat at the moment. Next is 26. Okay, oh, there's a beautiful one. I love these problems here. I didn't when I was a student, like you guys doing calculus, I was like, man, this is crazy stuff. All right, so this is that squeeze definition, the precise definition of a limit where epsilon is a dare. I dare you to get this close to the answer. And then our response to that dare is to say, oh yeah, if you pick X values in this range, then you'll be close enough in the end. Um, and so from an engineering construction point of view, this is a super, super important thing to be able to do, to be able to adequately predict um, at the start of a process, what the end result should be within a certain tolerance. That's what this definition is all about. Um, so we've got one third X plus nine, and we've got uh, X equals negative nine. Is the limit we're gonna play with. So let's write that down on the board. And they don't tell us what epsilon is. So epsilon could be a millionth or a billionth. So here we've got the limit as X approaches negative nine of one third X plus nine. Double check, I got that right. One third X plus nine x equals negative nine, yep. And if we cheat and plug in negative nine there, what do we get? Six is the limit. So that's our value for L right there. And the definition says, starting with F of X minus L. So what we wanna know is how far apart is the function value at any other X value but negative nine, how close are you to L? And we want that to be close, how close, epsilon close. And then we want to morph that into uh, X minus A is less than delta. And our goal is to discover delta based on the starting point. So we plug into the initial part here. So our F of X is one third X plus nine. Our L is six is less than epsilon. And our goal here is to make that look like X minus negative nine is less than Delta and then see what Delta looks like once we get 
this blue thing to look like the red thing. And note here, x minus negative 9 is equivalent to x plus 9 in absolute value. All right, so let's do some arithmetic here and then maybe a little algebra on the left. We do have like terms, so we get one third x uh, plus three. It's less than epsilon and I want a single x, so I got to get the one third out of the way. So then I think I will multiply both sides by three to make that happen. And then three times a third is uh, one x. And three times three is nine. So, hey, there's the x plus nine I was hoping for. And then whatever's on the other side is our delta, and that's just three epsilon. So then I would say let delta equal three times whatever epsilon is, and that gives us x values that are close enough. Um, reminder, the interpretation of this right here, this x plus nine is really x minus negative nine. And anytime we have the absolute value of a difference like this, and then a less than something, um, and I'm just gonna put, uh, just for simplicity, let's put a 0 0.5 there for now. Um, what that means is the distance between x and negative nine has to be less than or within 0.5. So number line wise, we're targeting negative nine, and we're saying you can't go any farther than plus 0.5 to the right, so that would put us at negative 8.5, or so it's supposed to be a 0.5, or uh, minus 0.5 to the other side, which would put us at uh, negative 9.5. Okay, so, so if this was my delta right there, I'm saying, hey, pick x values in this range. That's what this inequality would say right there. Uh, in this case, we're just giving a general result. No matter what somebody tells me epsilon is, I can say, well, delta should just be three times that, and we'll be good. All right, next, that was 26, that was 44, and the chat, I think, is quiet at the moment. Yep. Number 44. All right, so let's see. You use the limit definition of the derivative to calculate f prime of x and f double prime of x. So a double prime just means take the derivative again. So you take the derivative, see what you get, and then take the derivative again. And we have negative, negative 3x squared plus 2x minus 1. So f of x equals negative 3x squared, and there's some good examples of this in the book also I recommend you check out, plus 2x minus 1. We want to find f prime of x, which means take the derivative with respect to x of this function, f of x. So I'm just going to play with some notation here that you're going to see more and more often. And at the moment, the only way we have to take the derivative is to take a limit. So we could either use the what I call the traditional approach where h goes to zero, or we could use the alternative approach where uh, x approaches a. Anybody have a desire, traditional or alternative? Let's see, I got a couple chats. Uh, I think it's supposed to be three x cubed. It's a cube. Oh, even better. Okay, thank you very much. All right. So, where's my racer? Cubed. All right. Um, traditional. Okay. Thanks, Evan. So, the traditional one says uh, f prime of x is equal to the limit uh, as h approaches zero of, let's see, zero of f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. And I'm going to do this in that three stages. First, I'm going to find f of x plus h. So step one, what is f of x? Oops, premature parentheses plus h. Uh, and to do that, let's back up a step, right? f of parentheses equals negative three parentheses cubed 
plus two parentheses minus one and into the parentheses we drop an x plus h, x plus h, x plus h. And the fun part here is we get to cube the x plus h, which means take x plus h times x plus h times x plus h and get busy. So the first part here we've done many times, that's x squared plus 2xh plus h squared. And so now we need to multiply by another x plus h. So multiplying through by the x first, we get x cubed plus 2x squared h plus h squared x. And then multiplying through by the h, we get plus x squared h plus 2xh squared plus h cubed. And there are some like terms here. Um, there's no other x cubed, but uh, the x squared h, there's a couple of those. And then the h squared x, there's some of those too. So this cleans up to be x cubed plus 3x squared h plus 3xh squared plus h cubed. Uh, and if you're not familiar with this uh, sequence where we, we take a binomial and we square it and cube it and raise it to the fourth power and, and so on, that's called the binomial theorem. And there's a lovely pattern to those coefficients. And I'll refresh your memory on that uh, tomorrow or the next day. All right, so then we need to multiply all that by negative three and then bring in the other stuff. So that's going to give me a negative three x cubed minus nine x squared h minus nine x h squared uh, minus three h cubed plus two x plus two h minus one. And there are no more like terms. Nope. All right. So that was uh, the first step. Then we have to do the subtraction. And to do step two here, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to line up some like terms here. So step two here is where from the f of x plus h, we subtract the original function f of x. And so uh, underneath here, I'm just going to write the relevant things. Uh, I'm subtracting f of x. So if I take away a negative 3x cubed, that's going to be a plus 3x cubed. And then I got to take away a 2x, so I'll line that up over here. And then I have to take away a negative 1, which is a plus 1. So the original function gets rid of some pieces of f of x plus h. I got a little more room here. So what's left from step two, we get a negative nine x squared h plus nine x h squared minus three h cubed plus two, nope, the two x is gone, but I get a two h. Okay, so let's double check. That's gone, that's gone, that's gone. I have one, two, three, four terms, one, two, three, four terms, cool. Step three, divide by h. So take this difference, which we just calculated, and divide it by h. And so I'm just going to write over here. Let's just take that and divide it by h. And the safe way to do that is to realize here that each term here in the numerator has an h in it. So I'm going to factor the h out. So next to this, I'm going to write what that looks like. That's going to be h times negative 9x squared plus 9xh minus 3h squared, right? I'm factoring an h out, plus 2. And we're dividing that h out. So a number divided by itself, h divided by h is 1. 1 times something doesn't change it, and dividing by 1 doesn't change it. So now we're ready for step 4 to take the limit of that remaining part. So finally, step 4, the limits. Oops. So we get the limit as h goes to 0 of negative 9x squared plus 9xh minus 3h squared plus 2. 
And as I do that, right, there's no H in the negative 9x squared, so we get a negative 9x squared. This H is going to zero, so that whole term is going to zero. This H is going to zero, so that whole term is going to zero. And two doesn't really care what H is doing, it's just a plus two. So that would be the derivative here. So that right there is F prime of X. To find the second derivative, we just take the derivative of that result. So new page, we started off with F of X equals negative three X cubed plus two X minus one. And we found that F prime of X is negative nine X squared plus two. We want to now find the second derivative, which means take the derivative with respect to X of F prime of X. Now, just a note on notation. Hopefully you saw this in the book when you read it. Uh, F prime of X, right? So here's my second derivative outside. On the inside, I took the derivative with respect to X of f of x. And it turns out I can now take these two pieces here and put them together and write it as uh, pencil. There's two d's there. And you can, it's, it's not really a multiplication, but, but we write it like one. So we call it d2, so second derivative with respect to x twice in a row. So that's how we write the second derivative there of f of x. But this is the shortcut there. So I want to know what is the derivative with respect to x of our last result, 9x squared plus 2. And I am confident that you guys can take that limit as h approaches 0 of negative 9 times x plus h squared plus two minus the original function, negative nine X squared plus two all over H. Unless you really wanna see me do all of that again. Your choice. Chat. Um, All right, so Abigail and Kelsey have answers. They think it should be negative 18 X squared. Yeah, so you, you should find, yes, that after you complete this limit definition here and clean up all of that algebra, that in the end, that will be equal to, where's my pen, there you are, negative 18 X, yep. All right, and if this question were on the test, I would expect to see all of the steps that take, just a highlighter, this to that. So there's a whole bunch of steps that happen in between. And on the test, if there's no work, you're not gonna get any credit. So be sure to write down lots of work. All right, let's see, is there anything else? So I don't have any other questions in the chat, I think. I went over all the ones you guys asked about so far. Were there other questions y'all wanted to go over? Um, I used one of the derivative rule. Uh, Abigail, I don't understand. What you're saying there. The power rule. So we have not covered the power rule. That's in section, I think, 3.3. So you couldn't just claim that negative 18x is the answer without showing all of the steps on this right here. So on the test, I'm going to ask you to use the definition of the derivative, which means to evaluate the limit. So without evaluating the limit, you wouldn't get credit for the negative 18x.
All right, it's a question from Kelsey. I'm not a huge fan of scanning apps, okay? So to submit our written work, yes. So yeah, so I, I, I never said you had to scan anything. So what I do is I write my work on paper, I take out my phone, I take the, a, a good picture of it. Uh, make sure your phone's oriented right when you do take the picture so I don't get sideways pictures, I'd appreciate that. Um, and then you just upload each of those pictures into the, uh, the boxes that say add work on the test. So each question has an add work button um, and then you just click that button and you can add as many pictures as you want. So you can add one picture for each question or you, in, in maybe the first question, you can upload all of your pictures of your work. All right, we got another one. Uh, could you 12 from the review? Um, let's see. So from this here, uh, Evan, 18, number 12. Is that the one you're asking about? Yes, okay. Um, so uh, determine the vertical asymptotes and holes of the rational function shown below. So this question should have been a review from your uh, college algebra days. Let's give it a shot. Write it down, get to my notebook. All right. So we have the function f of x equals x squared plus 8x minus 9 over x squared plus 5x minus 36. So when you studied, studied these back in college algebra, the first step is to factor the numerator and denominator and see what's going on. So the numerator factors as x plus 9 times x minus 1. The denominator factors as, let's see, for 36, uh, looks like 9 and 4. So x plus 9 times x minus 4. 4 times 9 is 36. That gives me a negative. 9 minus 4 is 5. Yep. Um, so here we have a, a number divided by itself. Now, keep in mind here, based on the definition of the function here, as far as the domain goes, based on the original definition, x cannot equal negative 9, x cannot equal 4. So the domain would be uh, all real numbers but those two, or an interval notation, negative infinity up to negative 9, union negative 9 to 4, union four to infinity. So that's the domain there. However, I can divide out the x plus nine. And so I have another version of this function that looks like x minus one over x minus four. Now this red version here, I could plug in negative nine if I wanted to, and I would get an answer, but that's not defined for the original function. For the original function, f of negative nine does not exist. However, according to that part right there, if I take the limit as x goes to negative 9 of my function f of x, that's equivalent to the limit as x approaches negative 9 of that new version. And our limit laws say if the limit of the numerator exists and the limit of the denominator exists and they're non-zero, then the whole limit exists. And so it looks like I get what? Negative 10 oops, over 9 and 4 is what? 13, negative 13. So it looks like 10 thirteenths is the limit, even though the function at negative 9 does not exist. Right, so this function is discontinuous. Discontinuous at x equals negative nine, since f of negative nine does not exist. But there is a limit. So if there's a limit at a, a place where the function doesn't exist, then you have a hole in the function. So there is a hole 
at x equals negative 9. Now, the other problem here, so we've addressed negative 9. The other problem is 4. What's going on when x equals 4? So let's play with that. Uh, let me color what's the limit as x approaches 4. And the only new thing here from college algebra is this limit notation. Otherwise, you all were looking at the graphs of these things to try and figure it out. And I'm going to use the new version of the function because it's similar, simpler. So as x approaches 4 of x minus 1 over x minus 4. Now, if I try to cheat and plug in x equals 4, I get 0 in the denominator, right? So cheats, plug in 4, 4 minus 1 is 3, 3 divided by 0. So the function definitely does not exist there. But what's happening? Um, well, as I approach 4 here, right, think about this, then we'll look at the graph. Um, I could approach with numbers like 4.1, then 4.01, and 4.001. And if you take any of those numbers and subtract 4, that's going to lead to a positive denominator. However, if you approach from the other side, like 3.9 and 3.99 and 3.999, here I have a number less than 4. I'm subtracting 4 from it, so I'm going to get a negative number in the denominator. However, those numbers are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. The denominator is approaching 0. Let's scroll down a little more. So as x approaches 4, the denominator is approaching 0. And the numerator is fixed at 3. So we're fixed at 3. Bottom gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So the whole thing is getting bigger. But sometimes it's getting bigger and positive, And sometimes it's getting bigger and negative, depending on which side we're on. So what we should find, and I think I might be out of room, I got a little bit more good. What we should find for this, if we were to explore what's happening, let's say that's four right there. And we'll look at the graph in a second. Ooh, so that's supposed to be a dotted vertical line at x equals four. If we are on the right side, we should find this function is shooting upward. And if we're on the left side, we should find this function is shooting downward. Okay. And so it looks like there is a vertical asymptote at x equals 4. And so we should check with the graph to make sure that is the case. So I'm going to go whip out GeoGebra. And let's get a fresh screen there. And Desmos works sufficiently here too. f of x equals a fraction x, and go with the original definition, x squared plus 8x plus, nope, minus 9 divided by <clears throat> x squared plus 5x minus 36. Right. Ooh, I messed that up. Uh, plus 5x minus 36. Um, so what am I looking for? I'm looking to see what happens at x equals negative 9. And the computer is showing me, hey, something weird is going on there. So GeoGebra has some, a little bit of uh, mathematical analysis built into it. And it's saying something's going on at x equals negative 9. And if I ask the calculator, hey, what is f of negative 9? It's going to say, I don't know. I don't get an answer there. It's getting 0 over 0. Remember, we did have that alternate definition when we factored it and cleaned it up. So I'm going to write another function here called g of x and use that other definition, which was what? x minus 1 divided by x minus 4. And uh, let's see. And that is in blue. And notice the blue sits right on top of the green, right? So I'm going to turn off the blue. There's the green function, my original. Here's the new one. And the only difference between these two is g actually has a value there. So I ask, hey, what's g of negative 9? 
and it says, oh, that's 10 thirds. So if instead I ask for that as a point, negative nine comma G of negative nine, it says, yeah, there, there's a point there on the alternative version, but the original function doesn't have a point there, right? If I double check here, if I take, look for the point negative nine comma F of negative nine, this function's like, the geodesic says, I can't calculate that. If you plug in negative nine here, you get zero over zero, which doesn't exist. The other interesting point, so we have a hole there, we just confirmed. The other interesting point is uh, what happens at x equals four. And if I graph the line x equals four, x equals four, uh, this vertical line is the asymptote for this function. So if we scroll up, we can see on the right side, as x gets close to four, the y, rock, y value skyrocket, but they can't cross it because at four, we get a zero in the denominator. And we can see on the other side, it's dropping. And a table of numbers could also be used to explore that. All right, let's see what else do we got. Zoom, chat. Any other questions? Oops, where'd the chat go? Chat, there you are. Okay, you're welcome, Evan. Glad that helped. All right, so I'm going to, let's see. So uh, advice to you all, um, hopefully you've already looked at the exam and you can plug in that password and look at it anytime you want. Um, each of you get a slightly different set of numbers, but the same kind of problems. And let's get down to that section. Uh, definitely worth checking out those print exams I put in there last year, the 2018 exam, uh, exam review. You guys are obviously kicking butt on that and doing well. Uh, and this exam right here, reminder about my expectations here. You can use any kind of calculator you want. Um, but I do expect written work for every single question, and I expect you not to consult another human being. So it's not okay for you guys to work together on this, um, and it's not okay to ask a tutor for help or any other human. Um, but math apps are fine. I don't have a problem with that. Uh, but you do need to show work for each problem. The test is going to record, uh, save your work as you go. So once, uh, and you can go in and out of it. So you can put the password in now, do a question or two, and then close it, and then go back to it in an hour if you want to. And it'll remember your answers there. Um, before you finally hit submit, you want to make sure you upload some pictures of your work. So take some pictures of your written work. So what I usually do is I just email from my phone to myself, and then I can download them from my email and then upload them into this right here. And you can upload a picture per question if you want, or maybe in question number one, you could add all of the work for all the other questions. Um, that's no big deal there. But if, if you don't submit sufficient work, then you're not gonna get credit for the question. So I wanna see written work for every single one. Um, if you happen to get fancy with a spreadsheet, you know, like on one of these, like I did, share your spreadsheet with me, or if it's an Excel spreadsheet, send me your Excel spreadsheet. Um, but mostly I think you're probably going to be playing with a calculator like Desmos or GeoGebra and writing lots of stuff on paper. So uh, do good work, write neatly, make sure on your paper you number stuff so I can tell what I'm looking at uh, when I look at your work. Um, you don't want me to be guessing what goes where, that's, that's not going to be good. Um, and you, after you submit it, it'll just say your test has been submitted and it's not going to get graded till I go and review all of your work and then assign grades for each question. Um, and that'll take me a day or two to get that done. So if you submit it by midnight, I'll start grading tomorrow. It's unlikely I'll have them graded before class tomorrow though. That, that probably won't happen, um, but I'll probably have them graded tomorrow, Wednesday night sometime. Um, and otherwise tomorrow we're moving on to section 3.3. Uh, any last requests before I set you all free? Thank you for joining me today and asking such good questions. All right, so have a great day. Do good math. Take care. I'll see you tomorrow.